Hello. Welcome back. If you've been joining us for the first few lectures in the ceramic art history course. And welcome if you're just joining us for the first time. We're, this is the third lecture, part two of First Historical Civilizations. My name is Elizabeth Coleman, and I'm a teaching artist at Northern Clay Center. We have dusted off some of my old ceramic art history lectures from a decade ago when I taught this class at Florida Atlantic University. And if you are a teacher and you wanna use this for your classroom and have the students do some reading on the screen, we've listed the page numbers from two of our textbooks that students um, can complete prior to this lecture for additional images and also some context that isn't included in the lecture. Um, if you just want to listen and use the slides, that's great too. So we're going to get started today by um, looking back at this map from Charlotte Spite's book, or Spate's book, Hands in Clay, showing us the Mediterranean era and area and also Western Asia from the period roughly from uh, 2500 up to 1000 BCE. The first part of this lecture focused on Egyptian and Minoan ceramics. Today we're going to continue the lecture with starting with Mycenaean ceramics, um, which is 219 or the image there um, right over Greece. Mycenaean is the term that we're using for or that was used to describe the art and culture of mainland Greece from approximately 1600 to 1100 BCE. During the Mycenaean period, the Greek mainland enjoyed an era of prosperity, centering on such strongholds as Mycenae, Tyrans, Thebes, and Athens. Contact with Minoan Crete played a decisive role in shaping Mycenaean culture, especially in the arts. Wide-ranging commerce circulated Mycenaean goods throughout the Mediterranean world. The evidence consists primarily of vases, but their contents, oil, wine, and other commodities were probably the chief object of trade. The scene depicted on both sides of this crater, and a crater is a term that we use to refer to the shape of this vessel. It was used to mix wine, which was really, really strong, with water in um, the, the Mediterranean air areas. So on both sides of the crater, we have depictions of Mycenaean chariot races. Two tall, armless figures wearing long spotted robes stand in a chariot drawn by a pair of horses. Flecks of paint on the box of the chariot may indicate that it was covered with the hide of an ox. The horses follow the convention of Mycenaean vase painting. When two horses are meant to be represented, the painter, in an attempt to show perspective, depicts only one body but two tails, two pairs of hind legs and forelegs, as well as two heads. Stylized high stemmed flowers or abstract motifs decorate the background of the scene. To the right of the chariot, a female figure wearing a long robe stands with both arms raised and fingers splayed in what must be a meaningful gesture. Her breasts are rendered as two spirals and the features of her face resemble those of the figures in the chariot. Most likely she's bidding goodbye to departing warriors, a familiar scene on earlier chariot craters. 
Either that or she's starting the race, right? This Mycenaean jar with the octopus design is from 1200 BCE. Um, and it shows us a blend of Minoan and My Mycenaean stylistic traits. Quantities of Mycenaean pottery have been found in Italy and Sicily to the west and along trading routes to the east. The vases included many in the pictorial style, flooded into Cyprus and even reached sites along the Syrio-Palestinian coast and Egypt. This is a much more stylized octopus than the Minoan octopus jars. And um, that's pretty characteristic of early Mycenaean ware. Besides being bold traders, the Mycenaeans were fierce warriors and great engineers who designed and built bridges, fortification walls, and beehive-shaped tombs all employing masonry. They also um, made elaborate drainage and irrigation systems. So here we have some soldiers marching depicted on the side of a crater. Mycenaean pots employing nature motifs such as the cuttlefish, seaweed, shellfish and octopi used by the Minoans, but the designs no longer cover the entire surface and instead are positioned more formally. While Minoan potters filled all the available area on the surface of the pots with painted designs to produce fresh and effective results, Mycenaean decoration lacks this sense of spontaneity. The Mycenaean language is referred to as linear B. And I just mentioned in part one of this lecture that one of the reasons we call these the first historical civilizations is that they're the first ones we know to have a system of writing. Palace scribes in Mycenaean centers employed a new script called linear B to record an early Greek language. In the Mycenaean palace at Pylos, the best preserved of its kind, linear B tablets suggest the king stood at the head of a highly organized feudal system. In the center of this slide um, are linear B examples of pottery tags. So they, they made the tags and then fired them in clay and then would be attached to storage vessels or other containers with, with rope. Um, on the right is a pouring vessel labeled with linear B. The, the um, images look decorative to us, but that's because we don't have the translation here. The Mycenaeans also made female figures around 1400. These are terracotta. And most of the figures on mainland Greece during this time are female and seem to represent goddesses. While these Mycenaean figures ultimately derive from Cretan types, their proliferation on the Greek mainland may indicate an influence from the Near East, particularly, particularly Syria, where small clay goddesses were made in abundance at this time. Although very few have been found in situ, some were placed in sanctuaries where they were used as votive offerings or in tombs where they may have served as protective goddesses. These terracotta female figurines are referred to as phi, tau, psi figurines for the resemblance and shape to those Greek letters. The two phi type figurines depicted here have circular bodies completely covered with painted wavy lines, perhaps indicating folds of drapery. Breasts are indicated, although the arms are little more than bulges hanging down at the side. Their faces are typically pinched with eyes applied 
as separate bits of clay. The Tau type figurine has the conventionally hollow columnar stem with the head rendered somewhat larger in proportion to the body. Characteristically, the figure is high-waisted with arms rendered as singly applied strips of clay, folded neatly over the breasts. Like the other two figurines, this one wears a long garment, only here it is simply decorated with two vertical lines down the front and back. The figurine's hairstyle is particularly distinct with a plate that is rendered over the top of the headdress and down the back of the neck. A fringe of hair peeks out. By the late 13th century BC, mainland Greece, mainland Greece witnessed a wave of destruction, the decline of the Mycenaean sites and the withdrawal to more remote refuge settlements. Lecture four coming up, um, is going to be on the high point of Greek ceramics. We'll come back to that culture later in this series. Right now, um, we're gonna skip over to Mesopotamia, which is the word used to describe the area of the Fertile Crescent or where the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers are located. During this time in Mesopotamia, Architecture, sculpture, and painting became major arts, while works made of clay settled into a relatively minor position. From an artistic point of view, the finest works were made by the Hurrians, who ruled northern Mesopotamia and Syria for much of the second millennium BC. These Hurrian clay figurines depict women with stylized bird faces atop severely simplified bodies. In Mesopotamia, in Sumeria, writing was invented perhaps in the city of Uruk, where the early inscribed clay tablets had been found in abundance. Early writing was used primarily as a means of recording and storing economic information. From the beginning, a significant component of the written tradition consisted of lists of words and names that scribes needed to know in order to keep their accounts. Signs were drawn with a reed stylus on pillow-shaped clay tablets, most of which were only a few inches wide. This one here is two inches high and two inches wide. The stylus left small marks in the clay, which we call cuneiform or wedge-shaped writing. These are some um, depictions of the evolution of cuneiform writing or symbol language in Mesopotamia. And you can read from left to right to see how the symbol changed for various um, words from 3200 BCE to 1000 BCE. If you look at the symbol for barley, which is used to make ale, water, and bread. Um, those are symbols that we find often on uh, Sumerian and Mesopotamian ceramics on their ale pots, grain storage jars, and water storage jars. Cuneiform tablets often in, were often enclosed within sealed clay envelopes, and these were found in Anatolia, which is where Eastern Turkey is now. These documented transactions between trading colonies of Anatolia and Mesopotamia. This is a, so called a cylinder seal on the left. Um, it's very familiar to ceramic artists today. We would call it a roulette. Um, and that piece of circular clay or the cylinder is carved and then fired. And on the right, you see the impressions that it makes in, in wet clay. 
So um, these would be early seals or stamps used to label and also sign things. In Southern Mesopotamia, we have another tablet. This one is fired. The first one I showed you, the two inch tall one was unfired, but this one has been fired perhaps to keep um, a more permanent record. It documents grain distribution by a large temple. Further to the east in Bronze Age China, which is for the Bronze Age for China was 2000 BCE. There were um, a number of bronze technology areas, but the area along the Yellow River in present day Henan province emerged as the center of the most advanced and literate cultures of the time and became the seat of the political and military power of the Shang dynasty, which was roughly from 1600 to 1050 BC the earliest archeologically recorded dynasty in Chinese history. The clay work from this time period is clearly influenced by metalwork and bronze forms. This ritual wine vessel or zun is a fine example of ancient Chinese artisanship dating from the later part of the Shang dynasty. In early years, Shang bronze workers had imitated pottery shapes and decoration. Later, the complement was returned when pottery began to imitate metalwork. This zoom reflects the influence of bronze ware, the shape, the small relief flanges, and the marks on the incised decoration bands are an homage to bronze works made on a larger scale. These, this is a depiction of two bronze vessels and you can see the one on the left looks very much like the Neolithic tripod vessels from um, Neolithic China. And then the one on the right starts to become a little bit more like the bronze vessels that later Chinese ceramics copied. What I find interesting is that we also have pots that look like this because people are copying the bronze surface in their glazes, but that doesn't come until much later. The Shang Dynasty also perfected stoneware pottery that was um, impervious and uh, could hold water. From an aesthetic standpoint, many people prefer the Neolithic Chinese ceramics that we saw in lecture two and consider them finer. But greater technical advances were made during the Shang Dynasty. This non-porous stoneware was invented during that time. It's 13 inches high and the form itself is considered very rare. It was found in the Shang capital was probably intended for use in imperial ceremonies. Although made of clay related to white kaolin, which is necessary for porcelain, this ware is not yet a true porcelain. It lacked certain necessary ingredients and was not fired at a high enough temperature to be considered true porcelain. The decoration resembles that of contemporary bronzes consisting of spirals and meanders, as well as symbolic animals carved into the thick white body. The finest example of this type of ware and one of the well-preserved pieces is this jar in the shape of a bronze lee, or a lee is a large shouldered jar. This is from the Freer Gallery of Art at the Smithsonian in Washington. If we uh, leave China and go over the land bridge to North and South America for our whirlwind trip through historical civilizations, we end up in South America, or we could sail across the Pacific to the Americas, I suppose. Some of the oldest pottery known in Mesoamerica is from Tlaco, Tlatilco? Don't know, if you know, email me. 
which is today part of Mexico City. Scholars believe that Tlatelco, settled around 1200 BCE, was the center of an important ancient civilization. They, they had distinct and original ceramic sculptures, and these clay figures are among the most original found in ancient Americas. Varying in size and design, some are large and hollow and others are small and solid. They usually depict women, commonly described as fertility figures, their attenuated limbs and occasionally disturbing facial features have been interpreted as abnormalities indicative of special access to the supernatural realm. These definitely look supernatural or superhuman more than human. The most distinctive of these are strange figures with two heads or ones with three eyes or faces split in two, one side showing a skull and the other a living being. These later works perhaps symbolize the dualism of death and life. The Olmec civilization from the Gulf Coast region is of what is now Southeast Mexico made sophisticated ceramics. The vessels tended to be flat bottomed with delicate incised designs. This bird vessel from, uh, from circa 1200 to 900 BCE is an animal effigy vessel. These animal effigy vessels are considered the most engaging objects that we have from Mesoamerica. Often the animal body forms the entire vessel, but at other times the creature is placed on top of an equally hollow, low cylinder that is marked as with cloud or water motifs. The smooth tapering surface of the bird's body emphasizes the crisp lines of the beak, breast, and wings and the gloss of the blackware surface contrasts with the rough matte finish of the base. And other birds of prey were powerful symbols in ancient America, where they marked the realm of the sky. This young raptor, beak open and tongue just visible, appears completely bird-like, but has human ears. The combination of human and animal traits is common on vessels of this type probably based on a shamanic ideology in which predators of the sky, water, and, were, and earth were seen as group emblems. The Olmecs are also known for what has become to be called the Olmec babies. These hollow clay figures of sexless infants sometimes combine features of the jaguar an animal sacred to the Olmec with those of human beings. Many are modeled in a sophisticated naturalistic style and have great sculptural presence. Others are extremely stylized representations of humans. It's also notable that, the, that while they have baby bodies, a lot of times the head is more adult-like. This one called baby figure, um, is a pudgy infant holding his hand to his mouth, hollow, sexless, and often almost life-size. This one's 13 inches tall, so a little bit smaller than life-size. But these quote-unquote babies are curiously mature, exhibiting individual personalities and manner and posture. The finest are made out of ivory colored kaolin clay, while others are only surfaced with a wash of kaolin slip. Some figures such as this example, distinctive headdresses. What the babies signify is unclear. They may be representatives of elite lineages or early Mexican deeds of both. Infantile figures appear as sacrificial victims throughout Olmec art, and in some cases, the ceramic effigies may have served as substitutes for actual infants. Iconographic and stylistic associations exist between the baby figures and the monumental stone sculptures at the Olmec sites of San Lorenzo and La Venta. 
Both often have this tight-fitting helmet. There's so many of these baby-faced figurines unearthed that anthropologists, archaeologists, and art historians are convinced that they're important to this culture. But what they specifically represent, however, is not known. That concludes part two of lecture three. If you want to read ahead for lecture four, the great age of Greek ceramics, there's some page numbers here listed in Emanuel Cooper's 10,000 Years of Pottery and Susan Staubach's Clay, History of Clay. Also, um, please look up do an image search for the knock culture, and we will talk about that next time. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.